and also part of our restorative justice task force here at Wheeling Jesuit University. On behalf of the university, it is my privilege to welcome you to our talk tonight, uh, King's Vision, A Tangible Witness in a Broken-Hearted World, which is the final event of our 2017 celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Before we begin, I just have a couple logistical announcements. If you would please uh, shut off or mute all cell phones and electronic devices. I want to point out fire exits. There's two in the back, and there is one, one there. Uh, uh, Father Paul Abernathy will speak for about 45 minutes tonight, and then we'll have time for Q&A. That'll be open to the floor. If you are asking a question, wait, we'll have people passing around microphones. Please speak into the microphone because we are uh, live streaming the event, and then that allows the people watching it to hear your question and record it to, uh, for the archive. And then finally, uh, we had a reception before the event unexpectedly, but hopefully there'll still be some food and coffee left afterwards so people can stay and get to talk with Paul and Christina, his wife, uh, after the lecture. So at this point, I want to invite to the stage Father Michael Woods, who will introduce our speaker. Father Mike is WJU's newest Jesuit, although he is not brand new to WJU, having served here before uh, during uh, Paul's time as a student. Since August, Father Mike has served as the Sustainability Programming Coordinator at WJU's Appalachian Institute. Father Mike. Wow, so good evening. Thanks, uh, a little on the bright side there. So some of you may uh, know the, the well-known quote of Frederick Buechner, uh, the place where God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. St. Ignatius of Loyola would surely concur with such an insight. Ignatius believed deeply that when a person authentically discerns the spirit of God in his or her life, the heart grows profoundly in its sensitivity to the world's deep hungers. That is, wherever God's beloved children suffer any kind of indignity, whether it be through poverty, violence, or oppression, the heart is moved by grace and love to say no. We do not choose that way. As Martin Luther King said, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. We are so proud, but more so, we are blessed to welcome back Father Paul Abernathy, a 2001 graduate of this university, to speak some words that will honor the spiritual legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Not only that, I believe Father Paul is going to move our hearts to tell stories of broken hearts, of trauma-laden hearts, trauma-filled communities that cry out for healing, reconciliation, justice, and peace. Father Paul is a native of Pittsburgh, PA, and a recently ordained Orthodox Christian priest. He is the director of Focus Pittsburgh, an Orthodox Christian nonprofit focused on human development in the Hill District section of Pittsburgh. He received his BA in International Studies from this university. He holds a master's degree in Public and International Affairs from the University of Pittsburgh, and he has a master's of divinity from St. Tikhon's Orthodox Theological Seminary. Since its inception in 2011, Focus Pittsburgh has distributed over a million dollars in food, clothing, furniture, transportation assistance, identification, and emergency relief to the greater Pittsburgh community. This includes a backpack feeding program that distributes food to 2,500 children every weekend during the school year. Focus Pittsburgh is also, also offers free primary health, behavioral health, and dental care to Pittsburgh's uninsured and underinsured. Father Paul's most engaging work, however, is his initiative called Trauma-Informed Community Development. The idea came to him in part after hearing about PTSD among veterans 
after he himself served in the Second Iraq War. In Father Paul's words once when we visited him, He said, millions suffer from PTSD, and most have never seen a single day of armed military conflict. Rather, they have experienced years of violence in the inner city and the stresses that come from generational poverty and racism. Focus's model of community development works to provide holistic care to the person and the community. Cura personalis, cura communitas. Father Paul calls them micro communities to develop one person, one city block at a time. He credits his inspiration or some of the inspiration of his work to his Jesuit education here at Wheeling. Such an education touches upon the whole person that is, how one's physical, psychological, social, communal, intellectual, moral, and spiritual self is educated. Father Paul embodies these values of a Jesuit education that we seek to inculcate in many of you. To seek and find and serve God in all things, especially the poor and the brokenhearted. He knows that magis is more, is fundamentally qualitative than quantitative. He understands that faith must go hand in hand with justice, and he understands that all things are to be directed to the greater glory of God, AMDG. He has truly become a man for others. His deep gladness meets the world's great hunger. This is a work of the kingdom of God. Father Paul has received many awards, including the new Pittsburgh Courier's 2013 Fab 40 Award, Pittsburgh Magazine's 40 Under 40, and our own Wheeling Jesuit University's Father Pedro Arupe Distinguished Alumni Award. Father Paul is also the pastor of St. Moses, the Black Orthodox Christian Mission located in the Hill District the community where he lives and works with his smart and compassionate wife, Christina, who joins us this evening. His address, King's Vision, a tangible witness in a broken-hearted world, explores the meaning of Martin Luther King's healing presence to the civil rights movement, inspired by a spiritual heritage that was informed by a mystical encounter with the living God. Please give a warm, willing Jesuit welcome to Father Paul Abernath. Good evening. I cannot tell you what a great pleasure and what a great honor it is to stand here uh, with you all this evening. You know, Father Mike was here, like others, when I was a student, and uh, at that time he and others provided, as he said, uh, an incredible witness of how we ought to live out our faith and what really it means to be a, a man, a woman of God, how we should renew our commitment to live our faith among the suffering and the broken heart of the world daily. I learned it here. I sat in these seats many times, listening to the wisdom of the Lord as he spoke through his servants. And it's for this reason I am incredibly humbled to come home to Wheeling Jesuit. This is indeed my home in many ways. I think it is quite a task to discuss King's vision in a way that really uh, pays homage to him in a way that he deserves. It is quite a task. King's vision, what does this mean? When I, when I think about Martin Luther King Jr. and I reflect on what we remember him as, you know, it, it occurs to me that very often 
We think of him as a, uh, a, a, a civil rights leader who has achieved uh, great political achievements. As if, as if somehow uh, Martin Luther King got up one day and said, I, I, I just want to end Jim, Jim Crow. I want to be known as the, the man who passes the Civil Rights Act. Well, maybe we shouldn't be so quick to speak for him. Because his very last speech that he gives in Memphis on April 3rd, 1968, tells of something very different. You know, my wife and I, we were very uh, blessed to have had the opportunity this past year to travel to Memphis and to stand in the Lorraine Motel, the place where Martin Luther King breathed his last. Perhaps some of us in, our, uh, in this room have all also been there. This is the home of now the National Civil Rights Museum. But I cannot describe to you the sea of emotions that swept over me when I stood in the very place where Martin Luther King breathed his last. Yes, his final words, asking people to off, offer their praises to God. The speech that he gives the night before is the speech in which he says, I have seen, I have been to the mountaintop, I have seen the promised land. I may not make it there with you, but you will. These are prophetic words. He speaks of his own death. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, this speech that he gives is a speech of great courage and conviction. It is important that we understand the courage that he needs to have here to do the work that he has to do. He says, yes, I want to live a long life in this speech, but beyond any of that, I want to do God's will. I told some students, I told some students earlier, we were having a discussion about some words he shared, yes, that very same night when he spoke about, he spoke about the waters that they were spraying them with from the water cannons. You know, we all remember these images of people being sprayed down by water. We, we know these images. We remember them. What, what, what a tragedy we think. How horrible the oppression was. And yet what he says is, we know water. Yes, we know water. Some of us know water by submersion like in the Baptist tradition. Some of us know water by sprinkling, as in some other traditions. But we, we Christians, we believers in Christ Jesus the Lord, we know water. This is where the quest for justice begins, with holy baptism. Because it's not we, but he who dwells in us that can bring the peace that this land so desperately needs. Sometimes we look at the division in our land, sometimes we look at the suffering in our land as though this, uh, this somehow is, is something new, something different. But this suffering has been with us as long as there has been sin in the world. Yes, it has. And this is why as long as there is sin in the world, the Lord raises up his bright and shining star stars that he sends out to do his will. Yes, those who receive his Holy Spirit of God. It's important for us to know that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. also said the night before he died that of all the ages uh, 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 that the world had seen, this was the age that he pre preferred to live. Why? Because in this age, God was moving in a mighty way and people were responding in great ways. If we could only see ourselves in that way, what can we say about ourselves? We are those who are responding to the mighty movement of God. Those who are filled with the Holy Spirit and go forth doing the will of God. Those who are not only preaching justice in political terms, but are bringing the peace of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ to a world that knows only conflict and pain. This peace. You know, one of the priests in our church is an Orthodox priest. He's an African-American man. Uh, he used to play jazz. Father Jim, we were talking about uh, jazz, you know, jazz in the Hill District where, where, you know, I come from, up in the city of Pittsburgh. Jazz used to be such a, uh, you know, such a popular thing back in the day, and he, he played jazz. He was telling me, he told us one time, a group of us who were younger, about a time in which he was playing in a, in a jazz club, and there were the lights, much like, much like there is tonight. And he said, as they, were, as they were playing the jazz, as they were playing jazz, they noticed that all of a sudden, the room seemed to change. They didn't know what happened. All of a sudden, the room seemed to change. They didn't understand it. They kept on playing their set. When their set ended, they went uh, backstage, and they were drinking water and relaxing. 
Someone came up to them and said, can you believe who came to see us tonight? They said, what are, you, what are you talking about? Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King Jr., he was right in the audience. He hadn't come there to speak. He had come there to see the show. They thought to themselves for a moment, oh, this is why the room changed. Can we imagine changing a room not by the words that we say, but by the presence that we bring? Well, what a witness this is, because you see, any of us can learn uh, intellectual discourse. Yes, we can learn that. We can refine that. We can learn the uh, art of argument. We can learn that. But can we learn how to bring peace to a conflicted world? Can we learn how to heal broken hearts? Can we learn how to restore the brokenness of our fallen human condition? No, but we can acquire God's peace and become his vessel, a vessel of mercy, so that we can receive the riches of his kingdom. You see, we miss this point about Martin Luther King Jr., that he is more than just a political figure who was preaching the cause of justice, but this man was a man of God filled with the Holy Spirit that was able to change the room just by walking into it. And what do we want to be? And what do we want to become? Maybe we are sprayed with the water cannons and we will complain and we will, we will file uh, suit instead of thanking God for the reminder of our baptism. You know, one of the great saints in our church, St. Seraphim of Seraph, he says, acquire the spirit of peace and thousands around you will be saved. See, our world needs so much more than political solutions because, you see, political solutions cannot heal the broken heart of a mother who has to deal with the fact that her son was gunned down in the street. Political solutions cannot heal the heart of a man who laments the fact that every relationship he has had in his life has ended in absolute failure. Political solutions cannot heal the heart of a grandmother who has had to watch her grandson hold out of her house in handcuffs. Our people deserve more than this. And Martin Luther King Jr. knew this. You know, not long ago, I was asked to come to a, uh, a group of, let's say, troubled youth. They were in a special school. Troubled youth. No one else wanted to deal with them. They were in a special school. And I was asked to come and, and, uh, and speak to them. There was a teacher there. She wanted to, you know, prove a lesson because she wanted them to aspire to be like Martin Luther King Jr. And so she asked a question, which I thought to be loaded. She said, do you think that Martin Luther King Jr. would be disappointed when he looked and saw what had become of his people? I thought about that question. And I thought about who Martin Luther King Jr. was. And I thought to myself, no. No, he wouldn't have been disappointed. He would have shared in their pain because these young people are suffering. You see, that's what he was to so many of us. Sometimes we always look at Martin Luther King Jr. like he's the strong, wise man, as well he was. But you know, he too struggled. The dark night of the soul, he said. In January of 1956, oh yes, he struggled. In January of 1956, the Montgomery bus boycott. Do you all remember that? You all have heard of this. Yes, this Montgomery bus boycott, 1956, compelled those whose hearts were held captive by hatred to make a, 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 a threat against Martin Luther King and his family. They said, we will bomb you. We're going to bomb you. So the phone rang and he answered. You, your wife, and your newborn baby daughter, we will bomb you. Fear entered into his heart. Can you imagine hearing this news? Fear entered into his heart as he looked at his wife and his, and his, and his baby girl. Fear entered into his heart. 
How could he go on doing this work? How could he go on doing what he, what he felt called to do when this threat was facing him and his family? There was a woman, an old woman, who heard him preaching in the church shortly after this happened. See, she approached him. Sometimes, you know, little old ladies in the church are quite bold. They approached him. One of this, this, this little old lady approached him in the church. You lost your conviction, she said. He couldn't believe that she saw right through him. You lost your conviction, she said. He said, what are you talking about? She said, I know that you did because your preaching is not the same. In fact, his, his heart had been hollowed out by this threat that was now facing him and his family. She, she told him, don't you worry about it, Martin. God is with you and he's going to be with you. He went back and he prayed. Oh, he prayed. Sometimes we say, I, I want to I know how to pray. I'm always reminded of, you know, the apostles in the gospel who, who say to the Lord, Master, teach us how to pray. I hear people say that. People sometimes come to me and they, and they ask me how to pray. But this I will tell you, there is no prayer like the prayer of a broken heart. You know, as it said in the Psalms, a broken and humble heart, God will not despise. And there is no prayer louder than a broken hearted prayer to the ears of God. This I am absolutely convinced. And this was the kind of prayer that Martin Luther King Jr. was praying in his dark night of the soul. Maybe some of us can relate to the dark night of the soul. Maybe we've had it. Maybe we've experienced it. Maybe doubt has entered our heart. Maybe doubt has clouded the steps, the steps we know we are called to take. Maybe that has happened like it happened to Martin Luther King Jr. But you see, his fear and his uncertainty that gripped his heart drove him to prayer. And on his knees is where he says he heard the voice of God speak in truth and righteousness and justice. And I will be with you to the end of the ages. We remember the words that our Lord gives. Our Lord speaks these words when he comes to his apostles and he has risen from the dead. My peace I give to you, the peace of God. Not an absence of, of violence in this world, but an inward awareness of his love. The, 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 the understanding that he is present with us and we are present with him. A knowledge that everywhere that we go, he goes. That we are guided on every footstep by his holy angels. Yes, this is peace, brothers and sisters. So what if we die? For if we do, we will go home to our Lord and be free. This is peace. He said, yes, I want to live a long life. Martin Luther King said, I want to live a long life. But if I don't, it is no issue. Because beyond any of that, I just want to do God's will. This is more than a political champion of the oppressed. This is someone who is bringing the peace of God into a broken hearted world, a peace so palpable they can touch it and taste it and feel it, a peace so great that 60 years later, a, a, a saxophone player can remember the time he walked into a jazz club. This kind of peace, the peace that we are called to have, a peace that even if we are hit with water cannons, it reminds us of our baptism, a peace that compels us to look at the Holy Spirit moving in our land and focus on the stars in the sky, not the darkness of the night. This kind of peace that we are called to be champions of the peace of our Lord's resurrection. This is what our nation deserves. This is nothing new in the African-American community. No, nothing new at all. In fact, uh, this faith came out of generations that were suffering in the pangs of slavery. You know, our ancestors, our forefathers, and our foremothers, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, my ancestors were knights, and my ancestors were kings. You know, my ancestors came here or in chains in the belly of a slave ship. But you know what was so beautiful about that? It was in the belly of the slave ship that they learned how to pray in a way that their masters could never understand. It was those prayers in the belly of the slave ship 
that introduced them to a God who was so different from the men of evil who came to them, granting them peace and mercy and strength. He gave them the grace to move on. A God who was so beautiful, they spent their every waking hour desiring to be present with him. You know, we used to call these hush harbors. It was illegal for slaves to pray alone without white supervision or to pray at all. We have records of slaves who were beaten because they were found in prayer. And so they would send each other signals, steal away to Jesus, a signal that after they were working all day in the fields, they would steal away, slip away to these hush harbors in the wilderness where they would gather and spend all night in prayer just to be with God, the beauty of his kingdom to sustain them through this troubled world. What a faith that is. And for this reason, they were never really slaves. In fact, it was St. Ambrose of Milan who said, many a slave was freer than his master. And this is the faith of our ancestors. Yo, oh, indeed, they were freer than their masters. I'm reminded of the words of an old Negro spiritual freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. Before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. The freedom of God's kingdom. Oh yes, this is faith. You see, they couldn't be president, so they didn't want to be president. They couldn't be CEO, so they didn't want to be CEO. They couldn't own their own businesses, so they didn't want to. They only wanted to be with their Lord. It was the only source of their peace. And this is the spiritual heritage of King's vision, the spiritual heritage that, that compelled that old woman to come up and say, get on your knees and pray. For this is nothing new to us, this dark night of the soul. We have known this for hundreds of years, but we also know what to do when we confronted with it. Get on your knees and pray. For the Lord, the God of the resurrection, is with you and will remain with you to the end of the ages. You know, these words begin to change our life. When we live by them. In my own ministry, it became clear that the world needed a little bit more of this. Yes, it did. In my own ministry, it became clear that we had more work to do. That yes, it was about feeding those who were hungry and clothing those who were naked. But it was about so much more than that because our people were broken hearted. I tell people many times that the, the, the walls of our ministry have been baptized time and time again by the tears of the brokenhearted. I have learned that their tears are healing. I have learned that their tears are filled with power and grace and mercy. I have learned that their tears, painful and sorrowful though they are, are filled at their heart with a sense of joy and hope, unrelenting hope, that maybe, maybe, just maybe, our God is listening to us. In those tears, I have seen the face of God and learned that we are called to be that healing presence, this tangible witness in a brokenhearted world. In fact, I think Martin Luther King wouldn't say tangible witness. He would say relevant witness. This is what he said. Ah, how happy I am to see so many ministers having a relevant, a relevant witness in our world. And we want to do ministry sometimes on our terms without understanding the plight of our people. We must be relevant and must understand what our people have been through. Not only this generation, but the last generation, and the generation before that, and the generation before that. And the suffering continues as long as there was sin in the world, the suffering continues. And we have work to do. I was discussing with some students earlier today about how often I have been to community meetings where people have talked about the work that we have to do in the community. They will say, you know, we must develop our community. Our community needs jobs, which is true. They will say, we must develop our community. Our community needs housing, which is true. 
But all the while, they're arguing about how tall the buildings are in the drawings and how, uh, where the, the, uh, the, the, the green shrubs are placed. Our people are crying in the streets. They are crying in the streets. And nobody talks about it because we'd rather pretend like it doesn't exist. I've told this story to a group of uh, Wheeling Jesuit students before. But this became very apparent to me on many occasions. One in which I will tell you was a, a young woman who came through one of our workforce development programs. And she, she was a hard working woman. I could tell she was very motivated, very determined to work. And because she was very determined to work, we did everything that we could to help her. She graduated from our program. She went out, she got a job. We, got her transportation assistance, and this continued for a while. And then she came back and she said, I have another job. And we helped her, and that continued for a while. And she came back and she said, I have another job. And we helped her, and that continued for a while. And this pattern went on for two years nearly. I asked her one day, she came to me, said, I got another job. But instead of helping her, I said, we've got to find out why this is. I pulled her into my office, and I sat her down. I said, I said why? Why is it that? That, that you're always going from job to job to job. Sometimes you walk away from it. Sometimes you're fired from them, I'm sure. She said, that's true. I said, why is it? You have such motivation. You have such willingness to work. You have so much to offer, so much to give. She said, truth be told, there is a reason, and I've never told anyone this reason before. She said, when I was 15 years old, I was in a foster home. There were five men that lived there. And she said, one day, those five men held me down and gang raped me. And every time I lost my job, it's because they had me working with men. Well, at that point, what shall we say? Suck it up and get another job. You're lazy and you're ignorant, and it's time to go back to work. Oh, she deserves better than that. Especially for those of us who are Christian believers, she deserves much better than that. And I am quite convinced that it's not that in one moment she will be healed. This woman has got to spend the rest of her life healing. It's her story and so many stories like it that compelled us to say we've got to talk about this in the community. We've got to put it on the stage. We've got to stop talking about the size of the buildings. We've got to stop talking about the, the, the location of the shrubs. We've got to start talking about the heart of the people. This woman who was gang raped. We've got to talk about it or else we will never heal. Never, ever. We started a series of uh, conversations on community trauma. I cannot describe to you what it was like in those conversations, especially in the early days. The tears that were shed. I can't describe to you what it was like to be in the presence of those hearts as they poured across the floor. People didn't know that it was like that. They had no idea that so many people had suffered so greatly. You know, it changed the way we viewed ourselves, and it changed the way we viewed our mission. It changed the way we thought about our civil rights leaders who spoke of their own baptism and their own calling and their own following of God's will. You know, I'm reminded of uh, Martin Luther King's organization, we talked about this earlier. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, you know, was the goal of this organization. The purpose, the mission of the organization was to redeem the soul of America. It wasn't to end Jim Crow. It wasn't to pass the Civil Rights Act. It was to redeem the soul of America. And we began to see our ancestors in a different light. You know, W.E.B. Du Bois... So he speaks a little about this. The faith of the black man. This is what he speaks of. 
The black man's simple, humble reverence is so needed in this dusty land of dollars and knowledge because we have lost that spark within us. And yet in the African-American community and their suffering, they have maintained it. We began to understand our ancestors differently and we began to understand our calling differently. And we began to walk differently in our community. And we began to speak differently in our community. One woman said to me, we, we've got to speak life into dead places because we were surrounded by the walking dead, you see. So this became our work. It was this conversation on community trauma that, that led us to uh, what Father Michael uh, mentioned, this, uh, this initiative that we have now launched, Trauma-Informed Community Development, this idea that we are going to establish and promote healthy, healing micro-communities to improve the health of our overall community. How important this is. Sometimes we think about our communities, and I would say, what community have we to think of? Because if we look at the definition of the, of the word coming together with a gift, this is the definition of community, I think, well, who is coming together with a gift? We are afraid of one another. We do not trust one another. We spy on one another. This is not community. Certainly not as it was understood by the apostolic church. No, it is not community. And so we understood we've got to build community in many instances from scratch, one block at a time, if needs be. This is not simple work. It is not quick work. It is not easy work. But it is necessary work. We, we, we brought a, a group of community members together. We took some learning that we had from our friends at Duquesne University. They taught us about a process we actually knew nothing about called a consultative workshop. This is a process that taught us how to problematize solutions, problematize issues, rather. You know why? Because a lot of times we try to solve issues. But you know what? Issues don't have solutions. Problems do. What do you do about gun violence? I don't know. What do you do about education? I don't know. What do you do about child hunger? I don't know. These are issues. Issues don't have solutions. Problems do. And we said, well, we've got to problematize this issue of community trauma. And so we brought community members together, and we got to work. And once we started to problematize this issue, we started to build a response to it. We started to take community members and train them as what we called behavioral health community organizers because we had to have people who were proficient enough to go out and, and begin to build community where there was none. And oh, yes, as a footnote, one's faith is very important because we knew with what darkness they would be confronted. Not because people are evil or wicked, but because wounded people can do excruciating things, even to us. We looked to the memory of our ancestors, and we said, they have taught us that we must have a propensity to love, a love that's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And this is the very same love we must be committed to. So what if they punch us in the face? We have been robbed, we have been beaten, we have been ridiculed, we have been slandered, but still we love. Because to love is an expression of our true humanity. To love a people who cannot love themselves. To love a people who have never been loved. I remember a woman, the very same woman I spoke of, the first time I spoke to her of love, I saw the tears rolling down her face. It all sounds so good, she told me. Love, but I don't know it. So we've got to give it, we've got to live it. These behavioral health community organizers have been going around our community and doing just that, just that. Living the love of our Lord among places and with people who do not know and have never known love. Isn't that interesting? You know, I've traveled a little bit in my life. Not a great deal, but a little bit. I tell people that when I was traveling overseas, I didn't see poor people. I saw poor families. I didn't see poor people. I saw poor villages. 
You know, in the United States, people are poor and they are utterly alone. Radical isolation is the distinguishing characteristic of American poverty. So it is up to us to heal these divisions and end this isolation. What work this is. I cannot tell you what it was like to bring some of these community members together for the very first time with one another, even their own neighbors who they did not trust and they had disdain for, their very own neighbors who they were spying on and slandering, their very own neighbors who they feared. And then begin to teach them love by showing them love. Love that only the Lord can give. You know, this past weekend, we had a, one of our blocks came together. They had been going through this intervention for, for a, a, a long period of time, in fact, six months. The intervention, you know, we, we, we say we, we begin the intervention on a block with a consultative workshop, with the idea of helping people problematize their issues. A consultative workshop that helps our blocks produce what we call a HOPE plan. You know what HOPE stands for? Health and well-being. Opportunity making place making and engaging influencers. You know, we've used a lot of uh, research and, and science and data to support the work that we've done, and yet uh, uh, we've got to help our blocks form a community with this particular process. But along the way, there are those who remain skeptical. There are those who remain bitter. There are those who remain wounded and lash out. Yes, there are those. And I remember one day, one of our behavioral health community organizers came back and he said, I'm done with this guy. You got to handle him. Well, I said, well, hold on. Let's talk about it. He said, there's nothing to talk about. This guy is something else. I mean, he is really something else. You better go deal with him. Well, before I could get to go deal with him, this guy came to come deal with me. I thought, this is very convenient. And he was angry. Angry about what? I wasn't sure, but he was angry. People were saying he's no good. People were saying he's a stake. People were saying he can't be trusted. People were saying he's just trying to get one over on us. I said, well, we've got to go talk to him. We've got to go see him. I walked into his uh, house. You know, he drove me crazy because he was always wearing sunglasses. Well, I said he's got no respect, this man. The meeting went on, tensions eased, conversation progressed in a positive way, surprisingly beautiful. He came to visit me a few days later. I thought he came for something very specifically pertaining to the project. That's the only reason why he would have to talk with me. And yet he asked to come in and, and, and maybe just sit down for a couple minutes. Much to my surprise, he just started talking about his past. He took off his sunglasses. This is where the bullet went in, he said. He lost his eye. Why I always wore the sunglasses. He said, I, I struggle with forgiveness. But I want it so bad. You know, he wasn't involved in anything bad. As it would turn out, he actually owned a bar, went to break up a fight, and got in the crossfire from two men who didn't hit each other. One of them hit him in the face. This past weekend, we came together, and, and uh, you know, they asked if anybody would like to say anything. He raised his hand. I'd like to say something, he said. When we first come together, I wasn't happy. We've had our differences, but in the end, it all came together. What I've learned is that even when we fight, we've got to come together and pray. And everything will be okay. He closed with his offerings of love for everybody in his block. 
the same people who had despised him, who he had also despised only weeks ago. This becomes our work. This becomes the work of our reconciliation. This becomes a calling that we have that must be inspired by God in our relationship. You know, today we got a phone call from a young woman. She used to live with her mother. Her mother was an addict. And her mother used to pay for her drugs by offering her daughters to the men who brought them. Her daughter herself became an addict. I remember the day that we met her, strolling down the street. Homeless because she couldn't go back to that. A woman who had no mother, a woman who had no father, a woman who had no hope. And I remember the day she walked through the doors of our ministry and someone said, would you like something to eat? And they gave her something to eat. They asked her, would you like something to drink? They gave her something to drink. I remember watching those people hug her innocently for the first time and God knows how long. She's gone on, this young woman, to go to rehab. She's doing quite well. In fact, she's been clean for seven months. She called me today. I said, well, where have you been? No, I knew where she'd been. We have visited her. We've been in very, like, contact. But she had, I hadn't heard from her in a while. <laughs> she said, well, you know, I didn't want to bother you too much. I said, it's great to hear from you. She said, yeah, it's great to hear you too. She said, I have a question. You know, when people ask that, sometimes you don't know. <laughs> you know if you want, want them to ask it, because you know how you're going to answer. Well, well, I have a question, the woman said. He said, when can I come home to be with my family? Because you all's the only family I got. This is our work. This is why I know Martin Luther King Jr. wouldn't be disappointed with what he saw today. He would roll his sleeves up and he would get to work. This is how I know that our God is a God of love and mercy who has called us also to be vessels of his love and mercy to those who have no hope. This is how I know that even families torn asunder by the sin and darkness of this world can be restored and rebuilt in the Lord's kingdom. This is how I know that the effect of God's love through us is real and it's healing. This is how I know that we have a life to lead that brings peace to those who have no peace. You know, in one closing thought, brothers and sisters, I think it's worth reflecting again on uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and his final speech. I have climbed the mountain. I have been to the mountaintop. I have seen the promised land. I may not get there, he said, but you all will. Part of what gives him peace the night before he is shot down in Lorraine Motel is that he knows that behind him is a generation of men and women who the same God will raise up and send forth just as he was raised up and sent forth. Sometimes we think, oh, how wonderful it would be to have Martin Luther King speak among us, and yet the same Holy Spirit that spoke through him speaks through people in our day and age, sometimes not loudly on the stage, but sometimes very loudly on the streets. Sometimes not so loudly on the, on the Lincoln Memorial in the Mall of Washington, D.C., but very loudly in the, in the darkest corner of our slums. Sometimes not so loudly in the pulpit of a large church, as loudly as it is in the basement of a forgotten house. Yes, this we must preach and we must speak. We must be the ones speaking new life in the dead places, as that woman called us to, said we were called to. And yes, we must be those ones 
whom Martin Luther King remembered, who will continue to go forth and preach this gospel of healing, love, and mercy. It has been a great honor to be with you this evening. I look forward to continuing our relationship together, for this place will always be in my heart. And I know that together we are called to sow great works of healing mercy across our land. This is a time of great opportunity in our nation. This is a time where people are seeking answers to problems they, they have been struggling with for too long. This is a time where people have been struggling with conflict and now seek reconciliation. This is a time where people who have been betrayed are looking to build bridges. This is a time in which those who are held captive by pride are becoming freed by humility. This is a time that we can do the work that we are called to do with the hopes of a brighter future. This is the time that we must work and we must live and we must preach, brothers and sisters, and we must love boldly knowing that if we do so, the reward will be great. If not in this life, then in the life to come. And let us go to our grave with the peace of our Lord's kingdom, understanding that he is with us to the end of the ages. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, Father Paul. At this time, we have time for questions. We have, we'll have two microphones circulating. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you. Please make sure you use the mic for the questions. Um, hi, my name is Sarah. Uh, thank you very much for um, coming uh, to Jesuit and, and speaking to us tonight. Um, my question for you is, I see a lot of hate on social media, particularly mm. after the election and in regards to politics. I really actually liked what you said about uh, issues versus problems. Yeah. I thought that that was very insightful. Um, but my question is, um, and I'm guilty of this, is seeing an opinion you don't agree with, particularly on social media, it's very easy behind a screen to um, get angry and to you know, say whatever you want, and then it just sort of spirals into hate on hate on hate and that's really what it is. Uh, people completely disrespecting each other. It's not uh, productive discourse. What is your advice um, in this, I guess, in this political environment where people in this country are, according to some social science research, more ideologically divided right. than in decades past? Uh, what is your advice for, for those of us who get on and we see that and we see it on social media, um, maybe to, is your advice to step in? Like, wh what is your advice when we see that sort of hate on threads and on social media? Boy, that is a really, really wonderful question. If only I knew really the answer to that. <laughs> I'm reminded of uh, the words of, of, a, of a saint whose name I escaped at this moment, but he said, I have regretted on many occasions saying something, but I have never regretted saying nothing. And I think there's real wisdom in that, you know. Uh, someone told me one time that some are deep and some are shallow. A priest told me one time that a, uh, that, a, that, a, that a crick or creek, what do you all say down here? We say crick up in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh crick uh, makes noise because it's shallow. When a river does not because it's deep. Silence is the language of God, and yet we know we've got to speak out in very powerful ways. But social media can be very, very limited. And I think whenever we look at these discussions, I think sometimes to engage them can be a great mistake. You see, even those who we disagree with uh, ideologically, they, many of them, can relate to our pain. Sometimes we think that it is only a, a, a particular demographic that corners the market on pain, when in reality, we all can relate to it to some degree or another. 
I remember one day was in the ministry and uh, there was an impromptu conversation that kind of sparked up and people were sitting around. They, every, everybody was all, you know, everybody was all black right there, come from the hood, so to speak, and they were, you know, really c complaining about stuff. And I noticed there was, there was a, a white woman who came in who was dressed very properly. She was there, in fact, to volunteer. And they're going on and on. And I thought, oh, my Lord, this is this woman's first time down here. We're going to scare her off. I'm trying to tell them maybe we could talk about this at a later date. But they assured me that wasn't appropriate. And so the conversation continues. And after a while, and I'm sitting there all nervous, this, this uh, very well-dressed white woman raises her hand. And she said, well, you know, I've been listening to you all speak for a little while. And I thought that I could share something that uh, might be of value to you, but I'd love to get your feedback, too. She said, my brother was locked up five years ago, and I'm really struggling with this. You know, one of the things that I so admire about our community and I so love about it is that people are very honest about their pain. When in so many of our communities, to be honest about our pain, it becomes a scandal. And a lot of times, we've got to realize that behind this, uh, these uh, ideological rants are people who them, they themselves are hurting a great deal. For me, I think it has been really fascinating to speak to uh, this unrest and to speak to this pain in a way that people can relate to. Because on a certain level, none of us are at rest and none of us are at peace because this world is such a troubled place. And I have seen people with great ideological uh, ideas of great ideological descent. I've seen them come together and embrace one another. We've got to create more opportunities for this because there are so many people who want to do the right thing. They just don't know how to do the right thing. We've got to show people how. We've got to give them the way. Now, the only final thing I'll say about social media is I personally don't comment on things. The only thing I think makes sense to do is on occasion, whenever we see something that is edifying, is to share it. At the very least, if we can't stop the negativity that's out there, then we can put positivity there as, instead. Things that are uplifting, things that, that, that are wise, things that are healing. And we've got to exercise great discernment when we're doing it. But I think we can. And I think we should. Yeah, with all the political rhetoric that we've been through over the last uh, year in particular, um, yeah, what would you say directly about how to speak about race? Yeah. What, is, what are the venues for that? How do we uh, make some headway with trying to learn how to speak about this issue? Yeah, um, thank you very much for that question, Father. I think that uh, it is fair to say that uh, race continues to be a very complicated topic in our time. I think in many ways it's gotten more complicated uh, in, in recent years than, than it had been uh, previously. Uh, obviously, we qualify that because if we go back a little ways, it was very complicated. But it's always been complicated in the United States of America. I think sometimes we can act like, well, you know what, we were all living in harmony. You know, when they tell us the story in school, you know, that uh, we had the Civil War and then the North won and we were just all singing Kumbaya. I remember learning that somewhere. Abe Lincoln freed the slaves. It was all over. All the problems were over. And of course, history could not be uh, further from the truth. I think that um, the one thing I would say is, is that, uh, again, to quote Martin Luther King Jr., is he said, the most segregated time in American society is Sunday morning. And this is a great tragedy. You know, this young man who, who spoke, this young man who was shot in the face, who didn't trust and who was always had conflict in his heart, he, he said, he said, 
This man who, who couldn't forgive but wanted to forgive, the man who shot him in the face. We got to pray together. And we have to find opportunities to do that. Because this prayer does heal those divisions. And I know, Father, you, uh, you, you teach a, a class, the sacramental, what is the name of it? Sacraments for a Just World. And I think, how can we discuss this without not bringing in the Eucharist to this? You want to talk about sitting around a table. What about the altar of God? Receiving his body and his blood that we become one with him and one with each other in him. For in Christ Jesus, there's neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, nor male or female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. What about this? If our churches remain segregated, what witness does this speak to a troubled world? We as Christians must begin this racial reconciliation by reconciling ourselves to one another we can't all be in communion with one another if we're honest about it, but we can laugh with one another. and We can invite one another over each other's homes, and we can embrace one another when we're sorrowing, and we can be there for one another when times seem not to be well. This has to be a living witness that the world can see and touch. And let it begin here. I heard about a church just the other day, it was a white church, an African-American guy walked in the back, and a, and, a, and a woman said to a friend of mine who was sitting there, she said, thank God you're here because uh, we didn't know what he was going to do back there. But this is the attitude. If we're honest about it, so perhaps we can begin here. Now, I think beyond um, our Christian faith, I think that... Um, can find good works to do in one, another, in one another's communities. I think that, you know, in Pittsburgh, we are very segregated. We are one of 21 cities that suffer from uh, hyper-segregation. One of the things that's been uh, really rewarding for me is to see how the attitude in our community has changed towards whites. It's changed because uh, people were always skeptical of whites. Because when the whites came to our neighborhood, they came usually to buy drugs. People would say, this is why the city allows us to have an open drug trade here, you know, because if uh, they don't drive from the rich neighborhoods here to buy their drugs, they'll just be buying them there. They'd much rather the black neighborhoods absorb all of the trouble that comes with drug trafficking. I believe there's truth to that. And I will tell you that when whites have come into our neighborhood, not to save the neighborhood, but to say, what, we want to learn from you and we want to work with you, it has been an incredible witness. And I've seen whites and blacks come together from different political dispositions, never even knowing that they have political dispositions, because in that moment, they only see one another as human beings. There was a white community, very affluent, who said, we want now to have you out to our community, to help do uh, work in our community. Well, how can we not go? And I think we've got, to, we've got to lift one another up. We've got to support one another and help one another. A wise man once told me, when we close ourselves off for one another, we have the same old people thinking about the same old things for generations, and then we become guilty of intellectual incest. The same old bad ideas that become polluted and distorted over time. We've got to encounter one another. And that is the word, encounter one another. We've got to help one another and work with one another together. I think our, our hearts and our hands are open. Oh, well, well, they wanted to record it. That's why they I want the mic, I think. Okay. <laughs> thank you for your service oh, thank in you. the military. Thank I'm a retired Air Force. Oh, 30 years. thank you for your service. I'd like you to just elaborate on uh, your military experience 
and then how it relates to some of the challenges. And I, I'm with you. I usually don't deal with issues. I say turn them into challenges, and sure. the challenges uh, lie opportunities. But talk about the military, and it was a very positive experience for me. Sure. You know, it, you know, it was a team approach. Yeah. Of all races and and religions and men and women. Yeah. Thank you very much. You know, for uh, for for that question. You know, needless to say, I learned a great deal uh, in the army. In fact, I did learn a great deal in the army. This is where. It really got my foundational leadership training. I say, I don't say foundational. This is, you know, here is where I got my foundation in the church and others and my family. But foundational leadership training certainly I received in the Army. And I will say that uh, my leadership changed, especially when it was tested in combat. This became a very uh, obviously profound, life-changing experience for me. I was a staff sergeant in the Army and a uh, squad leader, not a very high position, but a position of some responsibility. And needless to say, for a young man, that, that does impact one's life. You know, whenever we could talk about being responsible for bringing people back alive, it's a different level of responsibility. But uh, to your point, it was at that particular time that you also see the value and importance of you know, working together as a unit and the value and importance of having order in life. Now, I will say war for me was a very negative experience. Uh, there's not much positive I could say other than it was there in the heat of that war that I saw the very worst of humanity and the very best. I think it was for me very, very important that it gave me an opportunity to explore the darkness in my own heart. Sometimes, you know, we look at things and we say, well, I could never have done that. I wouldn't have done that. I mean, we do it all the time, don't we? I wouldn't have owned slaves. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't lock another man up unjustly. No, sir, I would not. I wouldn't beat a woman. I wouldn't, we can go on the list of things I wouldn't do, but I'm here to tell you that we have it in our hearts. This is why we understand how important repentance is. Because we've got to wipe that darkness away with God's help. Now, my military service helped me understand that because I came home in no way ignorant of what we were capable of doing to one another. That is an important lesson. But just as it was important that I saw that, it was also in the war that I saw the very best that humanity had to offer, too. Because you can imagine the opportunities for compassion that come, God bless you, that come from that kind of horrific experience. There are gems that happen in there. For me, there was a lot of soul searching that I did when I came home. And one of my big takeaways from my military service was, in fact, what trauma did, you know, to the human person. You know, Father Michael mentioned that. This was probably what the defining, uh, the defining experience for me was that now relates to my work was actually uh, more about traumatic experiences because I came home and I saw that there were, uh, they were, the army, I remember eight months into my tour in Iraq, you know, I crossed into Iraq the very first day of the ground war in 2003. We had a command sergeant major, command sergeant major Slaughter. He told us, that was his name, I'll never forget it. He told us we were on the uh, border of Kuwait in Iraq. We were waiting, we knew we would go. We were at an assembly area hammer. And he brought us together, battalion, and he said, men, this isn't Vietnam, this isn't World War II. Only thing I need from you is five good days. Five days, and it'll all be over. <clears throat> Needless to say, we found a different reality. <clears throat> Eight months into our tour, there was a young man who just really lost it. <clears throat> now, he wasn't the first one, but it was a very bad breakdown. And because he had this bad breakdown, 
Um, they, they had to disarm him. This became a real moment in our company. The Army brought an Army psychologist into us to talk to us about something I had never heard of before, post-traumatic stress disorder. I'd never heard of it before. <clears throat> when I came home, I started to think about my own community. What alarmed me was I began to see what I thought was a, a thousand times a post-traumatic stress disorder in my own community that I ever saw when I was in the Army. We went overseas, and we spent one year at war. But what about our children and our families that were essentially spending their entire lives at war? And what, we're not going to help them because they never wore a uniform. But it was my military experience, that training, that emphasis on leadership, that certainly equipped me to begin to build this ministry from scratch. It also helped me place my own struggles in context. I felt like an old man not long ago. We had two young volunteers there. They were in their 20s, just out of college. And, and I said, how old are you? And they told me. I said, you know what? When I was your age, I fought a war. And then I heard myself, and I said, you know what? I'm just starting to sound like my grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> but it helps us put things into perspective. And it does, it does help us. And I will tell you the final point to respond, that order is very important. Of course, we know this in the church. Order is of utmost importance. Order we must have. We must respect order. We must respect authority and understand that authority enhances our likelihood of survival. Sometimes it's good to listen to somebody. Sometimes it's very good to listen to somebody, especially somebody who knows more than we do. These are some of the lessons that you know, I learned in the Army. I thank you for your question. Hi. Okay. Um, Hi. <laughs> um, and I think this goes to the idea of authority. It seems like nowadays even the highest level of levels of authority in this country seem to say that behaviors of hatred and oppression and violence are okay. Um, how do, we, how do we manage uh, a different levels of, like, you can get away with it when people are at the top, but not at the bottom. How do we, how do we manage living in a country like that? What an unjust world. <clears throat> when I was in seminary, when I was in seminary, I, uh, as part of our you know, practicum, we had to go visit people in the state penitentiary, SCI Waymart, in Waymart, Pennsylvania. They sent us to the forensic ward. These were very severely mental ill uh, patients, um, prisoners, who had committed heinous acts of violence. One day, I was sitting there, and I was talking to a young man, and uh, we clicked. He had very serious problems. Uh, he had committed two homicides in the city of Pittsburgh, which he was not repentant for at all. And beyond that, he spoke often of seeing demons and worried about his own ability to control himself. He had many problems, but throughout all of those problems, we were able really to have very beautiful conversations, and we developed a, a love and appreciation for one another over time. One day... We were sitting there in the prison, and the TV was on, and the president was on, talking about the war. He said to me, after looking at the television, can you explain to me why I killed two guys and get locked up, and they ain't killed thousands and live their life freely? You know, I had no explanation. And I understand there are different circumstances for all of this. Certainly we can justify things if we try, some would say. But this doesn't negate the injustice of this world. Where things are upside down, they are not right. 
I think that young man's comment must serve as a voice of conscience for all of us. We happen to live in a nation where we can influence the way things go. A Brazilian monk asked me one day, who will pay for the sins of America? Of course, he didn't know, and neither did I. But let us acknowledge that there is sin. You know, he said to me, this very same monk, he said, I don't understand you Americans. You're always saying you're proud to be American. I don't understand this, he said. He said, I'm not proud of my country. He said, we had actually only one hero, and he wasn't very good. He said, to me, he said, I'm not proud of my country, but I love my country very much. And I think that we have to love our country enough to speak as a voice of conscience for everything that our nation does in our name. Everything. Sometimes they hear us, sometimes they don't. But that doesn't mean that we stop speaking. And I will tell you, we must, you know, pray for them. Even our oppressors. Isn't this what Martin Luther King Jr. said? I will never let anyone allow me to lose the fundamental right to love. How can we not love those who oppress us? Or they just make us desire the kingdom all the more. And so we've got to pray for them, and we've got to bear witness to them of a different reality. And we've got to speak to them with humility and yet boldness. And at the very least, ask them to contemplate who will pay for the sins of our nation. Martin Luther King, you know, he said, he talked about the parable of the Good Samaritan. He said, I, I think the priest and the Levite, you know how the story goes, the priest walks over the man, and then the Levite walks over the man, and then the Samaritan comes and helps the man. We know the story, the Good Samaritan. He said, I think the priest and the Levite didn't help the man because they were afraid, because it was a dangerous road. He said, they were asking themselves, what happens to me if I stop and help him? He said, but the Samaritan, seeing that man in the road, knowing who God is, instead asked himself, what will happen to, what will happen to me if I don't stop and help him? And we've got to change the way we think and invite others to do so as well. But... There is sin in the world. There is sin in the world. Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. It doesn't mean the struggle doesn't stop. But we mustn't be surprised when the world rejects us. What was your question in the back? Oh, no. Thank you, Father Paul. Thank you all for coming here. I want to thank especially faculty and coaches and area churches for bringing people out. Uh, there is still some snacks and coffee afterwards, so please stay a while to talk to Paul and Christina afterwards. And again, one more round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs>